development. So uh, talking about the general principle of promissory estoppel, the case that uh, you know comes to my mind is the Walton Stores case, which is an Australian case. The Walton Stores case, in which case the court upheld the principle of promissory estoppel. And in this case, what we are talking about uh, the, the insurance case, Middlesex Mutual Insurance Company versus Levine, the court applied the principle of promissory estoppel and said that the, you know, it is uh, it's applicable to insurance contracts as well, and the insured must have relied upon the representation to his or her detriment. So you see the, the element that needs to be there for the principle or the doctrine of promissory estoppel to be used is, or to evoke that principle is one, there must be a premise or there should be, you know, a valid offer or a premise and, you know, or an agreement, a kind of an agreement to that effect a, uh, or the presumption that uh, there is an, uh, you know, there is going to be a transaction based upon the promise there is a promise on the other hand, and the promise acts upon this particular promise and the presumption of the transaction that is, you know, going to take place. There should be a valid presumption there, and he he acts upon this to his detriment or to the extent that it may, might cause some loss or injury or damage to him. Now, estoppel can be, of course, promissory estoppel or even equitable estoppel. Like, for example, an insurance company cannot receive a late premium payment and then cancel the policy on the ground that the premium was not paid within the specified period. Now, this is the same reiteration of the example that I gave just before, uh, like some time back. So yet another example is that insurance agent represents falsely to the insured about the existence of a particular insurance coverage based on which the insured purchases the policy, then in such a circumstance, the insurance company will be stopped from not complying with the justified claim of the insured. So this is yet another uh, example, which is, uh, you know, uh, normally, uh, you know, such kind of cases uh, you know, uh, presented to the courts where the insurance company tries to move away from their, uh, you know, their liability. They try to shun their liability, saying that it was not we who, you know, represented certain facts to you. It was not we who not who explained to you about the coverage, but there was this agent. But however, the the agent who is acting for the insurance company, uh, you know, has represented some facts which uh, or, or, or represented certain uh, you know statements has falsely represented about the coverage of regular insurance policy then the insurance company would be stopped from not complying complying with the justified claim of the insured you know where the insurer the the insured has acted upon the you know the the statements made by the agent and it validly presumed about the coverage that forms a part of the 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 current uh, insurance policy contract that he holds the next case is emmanuel versus us fidelity and go company now here the court observed that the representations made must have led the insured to believe that coverage existed. So you see here how the concept is developing. It says that the representation must have led the insured to believe that the coverage existed. Now, under, uh, under insurance law, even if there has been a representation made by the agent, so the insurance company cannot uh, you know, deny its liability, so the insurance company will be stopped by law. And the representation made by the agent on behalf of the insurance company or the insurer should have led the insured to believe that there is a valid coverage or the coverage existed. Now, in a US case, professional underwriters insurance company versus Freitas and Sons Corporate Corporation. Here, the court held that there can be no estoppel when insured has never ever even uh, you know, inquired about coverage and could not meet the threshold requirement of promise or representation. There's yet another American case that is Hornish versus American Chambers Life Insurance. The court held that representations by an agent as to the coverage under an insurance policy made before the policy is issued and does not stop the insurer from denying coverage. 
happens when the defense of the promissory estoppel is not available? So the next course of action or the next course is, of course, the normal traditional course of defense, either to deny the existence of the coverage or claim extension of coverage, as was also observed in the case of State Farm Mutual Auto Insurance Company versus Hans Now let's move on to measure of recovery, which is again a very important aspect of uh, insurance. Now the measure of recovery of claim in an insurance policy would be normally proportionate to the insurable interest and the loss or damage that is caused with a way the coverage contracted in a valid insurance policy contract. Now the factors to be considered in measure of recovery or in even computing or calculating recovery is the loss or the damage. The loss or the damage that is caused should not be too remote. There must be insurable interest. Like and, and the damage that is caused should you know should be examined in the light of the the coverage that is contracted in a valid insurance policy contract now the loss of the damage would be ascertained and evaluated based also on the valuation of the property that is damaged in case of property insurance automobile insurance or even fire insurance now what happens in property insurance or even fire insurance the value of certain goods would be at the time of loss they would you know they would uh, you know, ascertain the value of the goods at the time of loss and deduct the depreciation from it. And thus the current value will be ascertained and accordingly the claim amount would be calculatively disbursed. So depreciation could, would be considered, of course, to calculate the final claim amount for disbursal. Then the current market value is also a factor that would be deliberated as a tool to measure recovery. Next is the factor of the usefulness of the destroyed and insured product or property, also known as obsolence, would be measured. That is, uh, you know, uh, how the 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 you know how new is the product so the obsolence would be measured the usefulness of the destroyed product next is the factor of co-insurance if any especially in health insurance next is in, in case of more than one insurer payment of claim would be disbursed on a pro rata basis proportionately self-induced destruction of property with the intention of fraud or earning out of insurance claim is not permitted so again that factor would be considered uh, you know, uh, to you know, the factor would be considered of self-induced destruction, if any, just to you know negate a claim. So self-induced destruction is not permitted. Uh, you know, uh, as it would not be considered as a valid claim. Next is due consideration must be given to appraisal clause and arbitration clause. So what is this appraisal clause? Appraisal clause calls for the appointment of an appraiser to settle conflicts that is pertaining to the value of the claim and not necessarily about the existence of the liability as a whole. Then there is an arbitration clause as well. There could be an arbitration clause in, in the insurance contract where the arbitration clause calls for the appointment of an arbitrator and the, the award passed or the arbitral award passed in a particular conflict would be final. This is a dispute redress mechanism. And the dispute when referred to the arbitration is normally faster and more convenient. It might be a little expensive. However, it is faster and the arbitral award will be considered as final and binding upon both the parties, that is the insurance company as well as the insured. So this is how, you know, uh, you know recovery is measured. And uh, along with that, they'd also go through certain reports that need to be submitted, evidence that may be elicited by the insurance company for the purpose of calculating the claim. Next, let's move on to the insurer's right, the right of the insurance company uh, to defend or the duty of the insurance company to defend the insured or the, the right of the insured to be defended by the insurance company or the insurer in case of third party claims where the subject matter of the insurance is involved. So here, the insurance company or the insurer is under a duty to defend the policyholder against third party suits, which are instituted against the policyholder, where the subject matter of the insurance comes under litigation. Here, the question is not about what and who is right or wrong. Invariably, when the insured or the policyholder faces a legal battle opposed the subject matter covered under a valid insurance policy, the insurer is customarily obligated to defend the insured. Now here, 
the principle or the rule that is applicable is the four corner rule or the eight corner rule. So to determine whether the insurer is obliged to defend the insured or in a, in a third party litigation, the pages and the clauses of the insurance contract need to be meticulously browsed through or read uh, within the presence of the insurance uh, the, or the insurance contract are the answers to the questions whether the insurer is, you know, uh, liable to defend uh, the insured in a particular case that may be brought against or in a particular litigation that is brought against the insured. So this is called when you study it within the presence of the insurance contract, it's called the four corner rule or the eight corner rule because the question is whether at all the insured has got the right to be defended by the insurance company or the insurer has got the duty to defend. Generally speaking, the insurer or the insurance company has to defend the, 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 insur the insured when there is a third party claim. It has to be implemented as a party and they have to present themselves to the court when the subject matter is, you know, uh, is insured and is part of a valid insurance policy contract. Now, ambiguous claims, remote claims, and litigations which are beyond the ambit of subject matter of insurance, of course, cannot compel the insurer to participate and defend the policyholder. Now, what is the implication of, 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 of this uh, rule, the, the four corner rule or the eight corner rule? What is the implication of it? So the implication of the insurer exercising the duty to defend the insured? and the insured's right to be defended to the extent of the subject matter of the policy that is insured under a valid insurance policy. What's the implication? The first thing is, should the court decree in favor of the third party and the decree be executed? That means there is uh, you know, an application for uh, executing the particular decree that has been passed. So the insurance company will be expected to pay the entire amount under the policy contract in case there is a court order to that extent, to which the insured is legitimately entitled under the specific insurance scheme. And consequently, or as a result of that, nothing remains or something or very little might remain to be or partially to be disbursed to do the policy holder. Yet another implication is, or yet another angle that can uh, you know, be seen in such, in such situations is, uh, if the insurer or the insurance company has already satisfied the claim prior to the litigation, then the insurance company certainly will not be made a party to the lit litigation under an expired insurance contract. The next thing is in case the insurance company fails to defend such litigation, what happens? In case the insurance company fails to present themselves in the court, even after being impeded, uh, in that particular litigation as one of the parties. So in case the insurance company fails to defend such litigation during the subsistence or the existence of a valid insurance contract, then the court would make the insurance company liable for any additional costs borne by the policyholder in that regard, such as autonomy fees and so on, or even court fees, etc. And the court may also extend damages or, uh, you know, avoid damages to the insured or make the insured you know, uh, you know, they would for the mental agony that has that is suffered by the insured for the insurer's breach of duty towards the insured of not defending the right of the insured in a third party litigation where the subject matter of insurance was involved. Now, for a breach of duty or even negligence of the insurance company in exercising its duty in this context, the courts may impose pecuniary damages that may even exceed the cost value of the policy. So that means it would, uh, I, mean, I mean, there would be monetary damages that need to be paid or, or the, where the damages, you know, might exceed the cost or the value of the contract uh, itself, the insurance policy contract itself. So that's not really a very good scenario there. So the insurer or the insurance company, in order to protect itself from such kind of situations, 
or again, such an allegation of failure to defend by provision to that effect. So what they would do, they, they would have a provision to that effect in the insurance contracts under a waiver clause, or maybe execute a rider or an additional document appended to the insurance contract on the waiver. So in the alternative, the insurer can ask, can even seek a precautionary step uh, or a declaratory ju uh, a judgment action, bring a declaratory judgment action against the insurer, the policyholder, and determine the coverage of the policy, etc. So, in the pursuit of safeguarding against any future claims that may exceed the policy limit, apprehensive of a failure to defend in case of being implicated as a party to a third party litigation in which the subject matter of the policy is made a part of it. So, you know. The, the insurance company can have, can bring a declaratory judgment action against the insured, or it might have, you know, a, a, in the waiver form, it might, it might add a provision to that extent. And the third option for, uh, before the insurer or the insurance company is to issue a reservation of rights letter in lieu of a waiver document with the intention of informing the insured or the policyholder of not intending to participate in such external claims or third party claims, but instead would encourage the policyholder to seek the advice of a lawyer in that direction. I mean, it's, it's a quite, um, you know, a, I would say a smart way of really, uh, you know, uh, moving away from this uh, obligation of being implicated as a party, and in, even if they are, so seek the permit, uh, seek the advice of a good insurance lawyer in the direction, and uh, you know, and uh, you know, should such a situation or uh, need arise. So these are some of the ways. Uh, basically three ways how an insurance company or the insurer can protect itself against you know such an allegation of failure to defend so they could have a provision reiterating they could have a provision uh, in the insurance contract it could be it could be under a waiver document or a clause or a rider or they could bring a declar declaratory judgment action or they would just issue a reservation of rights letter they, they would reserve the rights so the next part of it is Reinsurance. Now, reinsurance is a very, uh, again, interesting concept under, you know, the business of insurance or even the laws of insurance. So insurance, of course, comes under the service sector. Also, I would say that under, you know, in the world of insurance or even under, you know, the insurance laws. What is reinsurance? I want you to just, uh, you know, Apply your mind to it for some time and think about this. What is reinsurance? Of course, you know what is insurance and what is reinsurance. Wait a moment. So reinsurance is not to, you know, revise the insurance policy. Normally, when the question is asked, students tend to answer saying that it's a revision of insurance policy, or they would say insure, reinsure, reinsure it. So what is a reinsurance? So reinsurance is basically a, a reinsurance policy or a contract which is normally procured by insurance companies. So reinsurance is a policy that is sought by the insurer and not the insured. I'm repeating. It is a policy that is sought by the insurer and not the insured. So reinsurance is what it is. It is a provision or a policy that is open to the insurance companies who are normally insurers in a normal insurance contract with the insured. So here are the parties in Reinsurance are who are the parties here is the reinsurer and the reinsured. The reinsured is also called as a seated party or you know the party who's seated. So here there is a company, an insurance company who desires to you know who enters into a seeding agreement, CED. I'm not talking about this here. You know, they would like to, uh, you know, share the risks because of the load of risks that they carry from different insureds or from, you know, which are from different existing insurance policies. I mean, the load of risk 
and gets too heavy for them to bear. For whom? For the insurance company. They take the help of other insurance company in the sector and they take a policy of reinsurance. Let's see what it is. Now, this is the insurance for the insurers or the insurance company. What is reinsurance? Reinsurance is the insurance for insurers or for the insurance companies. Reinsurance is a situation or an arrangement where the insurer becomes the insured by transferring partly or wholly the risks that is that has undertaken that it has undertaken to cover in certain circumstances to another insurance company or insurer by executing a valid reinsurance contract and thus would be referred to as reinsured so it's also called as a stop loss insurance to avoid carrying a heavy load of risks and share it with another insurance company under a legitimate arrangement of executing a valid contract for a consideration, of course, that the consideration here in insurance contracts or reinsurance contracts is always a premium to that effect, and that is called as a reinsurance contract. So the backing of another insurance company is sought here by an insurance company when it is unable to manage the load of risk and pecuniary cover, pecuniarily cover those risks. So the subject matter of the reinsurance contract here is the insurance liability. I'm repeating, this is important. The subject matter of reinsurance contract here is insurance liability. In Union Central Life Insurance Company versus Low, the court held that it involves the principle of indemnity. Here, in insurance contracts, by and large, the principle of indemnity revolves around or is the essential factor in reinsurance contracts. This concept is distinct from co-insurance, of course, or multiple insurances sought by the insurer. So reinsurance should not be confused with, you know, with co-insurance or multiple insurances sought by the insured. Reinsurance is the insurance policy cover obtained by insurance companies. Now, in Beth K. Wasser's Cosmopolitan Life Insurance Company, the court observed that reinsurance is a contract which one insurer makes with another to protect the first insurer from the risk that is already assumed by whom? By, by whom? By the other insurer. So in this case, it's of course an insurance company. Now the company getting the risk reinsured here is called a seeding company. Note the, the, the spelling there, seeding company, C-E-D-I-N-G. The seeding company, the company that gets is the insurance company rather, getting the risk reinsured, the risk or the load, the burden that is carrying through valid insurance contracts with the other insured within the company. So to share the risk, you know, it gets into the contract of reinsurance with a reinsurer. So the person or the the the, 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 the insurance company with uh, you know, tries to get, get its risk insured in a valid reinsurance contract is called a seeding company. And the amount of risk retained by the seeding company is called retention. Because what happens? Sometimes they would, you know, partially seed the risk or partially share the risk. Or sometimes this, it's possible that they would really share the risk entirely. So suppose there is a partial sharing of risk. The amount of risk that is retained by the seeding company is called retention. Now the amount of value reinsured is called session. I'm repeating. The amount or the value reinsured under a valid reinsurance contract is called session. Now the reinsurance company may further want to reinsure the risks that it has contracted to reinsure, and that is called retrocession. You see here? Now, see now there is company A, and it, it is an insurance company. It feels that it has you know, overloaded itself with several insurance policies that it has actually you know, contracted with different uh, you know, uh, customers. 
so it feels a risk heavy so it takes the help of another insurance company and it you know seeks a reinsurance for sharing the risk along with it so this company a is called a seeding company okay now this company a the seeding company the amount that it seeks to reinsure that amount is called session okay it might happen that there is this you know company b who's a reinsurer between a and b for the risks of a it might also go ahead further and get its risks insured to another company c so this company or this process is called retrocession now c has nothing to do with a c has something to do with b under the contract of retrocession b has got something to do with a under the contract of reassurance okay and a has something to do with the insured so a is uh, you wouldn't call it uh, you know as um uh, you can call them even as the reinsured or they're actually called as the seeding company so the reinsured or the seeding company has a relationship with the insured here where a technically speaking is a seeding company or normally speaking is the reinsured 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 the seeding company so now in case there is a problem with any of the contract between the seeding company or the reinsured year the insured the, on the other side may not be aware of the 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 transactions that the insurance company is you know transacting it's not interested and they're not a party to it because this is a distinct contract now in case there is an insured there whose risk is partially covered by say b okay by b who is the 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 reinsurer okay so this person say let's call uh, the insured x x cannot get his claim or file an application uh, claiming the amount that is due to him from you know b why because there is no relationship between b and x are you understanding me so in fact there is a high possibility or in fact probably or it is like improbable that x ever knows or even knows that b exists are you understanding me so now it is for this party a you know to get the redressal from b or whether it gets a redressal or not you know get it you know resolve this issue of claim with the insured i understand you because there is no contract basically between c and x here so this is all about reinsurance in simple terms so the concept is pretty simple reinsurance is the insurance for the insurance company where the insurance company that is seeking insurance reinsurance is called the seeding company and the company that is reinsuring is called the reinsuring company or the reinsurer so the general principle is a contract is between the direct insurer and the insurance reinsurer it is the direct insurer who will be made liable to the direct insured and not the reinsurer 
and there is no contract that really exists between the insured and the reinsurer. The contract here is between the reinsurer and the reinsured or the seeding company here. So thereby the benefit of reinsurance that comes to the fore is the risk that is uh, you know, contracted to be transferred. So the, the benefit of reinsurance that comes to the fore is the risk is, you know, that is contracted to be transferred is basically, you know, shared and it is, you know, really spread and it lightens the burden of seeding companies or seeding insurance companies or the re the reinsurance. I mean, just, you know, generally speaking about technical parlance, insurance parlance, they are called as seeding companies. So broadly, reinsurance can be dichotomized as treaty insurance. I mean, there are two categories, treaty insurance and facultative reinsurance. So this dichotomy basically helps us to understand the method used to cover the risk, whether it's proportional or non-proportional. Now, treaty insurance is a pre-arranged agreement whereby the direct insurer cedes and the reinsurers accept sessions with predetermined limit insurance. It is mandatory to accept risks under this method. Thereby, there is a treaty or an agreement drawn between two or more insurance companies here, whereby one agrees to cede its risk, that is a direct insurer, and the other company or the companies, that is the reinsurers, agree to accept reinsurance as per the conditions that are specified in a particular treaty or an agreement between them. So there are different types of treaty reinsurance. However, the most common forms are QS or quota share. It's also called as proportional sharing. That is a particular proportion is ceded. That is where the reinsurers take a specific share or proportion of risk or the obligation to uh, you know, pay claims in each policy, which is directly proportional to the premium of reinsurance, where the risk is shared between two insurance companies. Uh, under the scheme of reinsurance. So original risk is sought to be shared here. Next to the surplus excess of loss, it's also abbreviated as SOL, uh, surplus excess of loss, SOL. Here, direct insurer, no, I'm not talking about SEOL, I'm talking about SOL. Here, direct insurer reinsures only the surplus amount and its re retention and the reinsurers are inclined to accept such sessions. I'm talking about C-E-S-S-I-O-N. Next is excess of loss ratio or XOL or stop loss. Here there is a nexus that is drawn or the relationship is examined between gross premium and gross claim over a year. And based on which gross loss is determined, that depending upon what is the gross premium, what is the gross claim, gross loss is determined and the ceiling company will decide on the ratio of gross loss up to which it can sustain. Next is a combination strategy of QS and XOL. And next is pools, which are basically treaties between companies where members join hands to share premiums as well as claims. So this form is normally used to cover risks or insurance policy of hazardous businesses. Next is non-proportional. This is pretty simple. Here, the reinsurers, here, the reinsurer, the, the reinsured are not proportionally liable for the loss. Likewise, premiums also are not proportionally shared with the reinsurers, which means the losses covered may be in excess of the value of the insurance cover. So the loss is reinsured in the non-proportional method. The last part is facultative reinsurance. In facultative reinsurance, it's normally used in simple businesses and covers which are not really complex in nature, where risks are optionally reinsured, handled on a case-to-case -case basis, where the sedent, I told you what's sedent, who are sedents, where the sedent passes a single or a block risk on a one-off basis. I'm repeating this. Facultative reinsurance is normally handled on a case-to-case -case basis where the sedent passes a single or a block risk on a one-off basis. It is distinct from treaty insurance, reinsurance, to the extent that a separate reinsurance policy is contracted for each risk. So this method is indubitably 
flexible or undoubtedly flexible and tailored to meet the needs of reinsurance and may be further classified into two prorata and excess of loss. So this is all for today's class. We have completed the syllabus. Today, we have learned about uh, three basic concepts. The first one being you know, the general concepts which are normally applicable to contractual laws and how we apply them to insurance, that is insurance waiver and the doctrine of estoppel. The next part under chapter eight, we've learned about measure of performance, how performance is measured. You see here, for those who have just entered the class, already class is over and today it has been a long class. Well, so measure of recovery there. And the next chapter we have spoken of today is the insurer's right or the duty to defend. And in this case, it is the duty of the insurance company to defend the insured in third party claims where the subject matter that is involved in third party claim is the, you know, covered under that particular insurance policy. So technically speaking, it is the insured's right to be defended in third party claims in case the insurance company or the insurer is impeded as a party there. Or you could also say that it is the insurance company's duty or insurer's duty to defend the insured in third party claims. We've learned about the implications of that. And the last part of it is the reinsurance. Now in your course description, though I have mentioned even the, the, you know, the concept of subrogation, I'm not doing it under this session. The reason being that it's already discussed in the previous sessions. I've already dealt with subrogation under previous sessions. So there are 10 chapters in all. Excuse me, there are 10 chapters in all and uh, we have completed it. I've completed the syllabus for you know, uh, insurance law. And um, if you have any questions, of course, you can ask, ask me. Normally, you know, attendance is not granted for those who come late to class because we've already finished the class here. So it's already 11. I mean, for you, it's 10. Uh, your time, it's 10 a.m. However, I will consider giving because this is the last class. So Abdir Haman, could you just tell me your full name? Are you there? And who is... Uh, who has uh, logged into Galaxy A11? What's your name? Can you hear me? Okay, never mind. So I, I, if I do not know who you are, so it will be difficult for me to grant attendance. It's not a problem. Uh, well, now talking about assignments, assignments must be submitted uh, within the deadline and anything that is submitted beyond the deadline, uh, you know, uh, it would be liable to a deduction of one mark. Now, I've already given you uh, the important questions. Uh, you know, I've already... Uh, rather, uh, you know, given the question paper pattern. Now, talking about important questions. The question paper pattern, just before that, like before I go through that. The question paper pattern, of course, there'll be a question for, you know, 20 marks. And uh, again, of course, you have choice. You just have two choice, one choice there. Mm -hmm. And next would be the uh, write a long note on, an elaborate note on, again, to carry five marks and again there's a choice there now the important uh questions for your exams you have to know what is an insurance contract you'll have to give me the definition of insurance contract 
and the definition that you give me should be an elaborate one. You will have to explain in detail what is, you know, the insurance contract and so on. This is one of, you know, the important questions. Normally in insurance law, of course, you know, insurance contracts, insurance contracts are normally a very important question. So it would be asked mostly, most of the times, like, you know, for examinations, it comes. And next, of course, in case such a question is asked, you'll have to write about the clauses that have to be there in insurance contracts and the principles are involved there. And you have to, you know, this being, a, you know, a law subject and just not, uh, you know, just only insurance, but it's also a law subject, insurance law. So you will have to uh, explain the, you know, uh, the case laws that are there, the relevant case laws. Apart from that, again, an important question would be like the process of filing claims. This is also an important question. Um, again, you know, certain concepts like Uber MFIDE and promissory estoppel, waiver, all these are important questions. Um, yeah, and of course, uh, since you're learning insurance law in the international perspective, again, this is very, very important question because I have taught you insurance law in the international perspective where I made reference to different countries, like what is uh, like the law in USA, what's the law in UK, what's the law in India, what's the law in UAE, that is United Arab Emirates, what's the law in the Sultanate of Oman, in Spain, Germany. I've given you examples and uh, I've given you, you know, a, a, the overall view of all the, these countries and some more. So, I mean, I normally, you know, say that my students should understand the laws in the international perspective because, you know, you know, it's it's good to understand insurance laws in the uh, international perspective. And again, this is an important question again. So, well, all the best for your exams. We'll have another class next week. And uh, probably if you're there on time, we will have a quick revision or maybe I'll sort out some doubts. And we have done with our lectures. The lectures are posted in your Google Classroom. Go through the lectures. I've given you also, uh, you know, the points for studying and uh, the PPT also will be, is already uploaded online. Uh, except today's class. So today's class, you can expect it to be uploaded by the end of the day, maybe in an hour or by the end of the day. It depends. And of course, this video also will be uploaded. So all the best uh, for your exams. And if you have any questions, of course, you can ask me. But uh, uh, now it's no point uh, for me to say that attendance carries marks because this is the last class. In the next class, we meet the same time. It is 8 a.m. your time. And if no one's available for the first 10 minutes or 15 minutes, so uh, I mean, I would presume that uh, you don't need a revision class. So if you need anything, uh, please be there for the next class. So with respect to the syllabus, we are done today. So thank you. Bye-bye. And all the best.